as Todd was leading us this morning in the song in the in the worship. That song, keep your eyes or keep your eyes on Jesus. Uh, it's not exactly the title I heard, but really struck me and how well it fit with uh, this uh, this the message today. This flicker of faith. There's a one big idea in this, and uh, the big idea is when no one is watching. God will see your righteous actions and use them for his providential purposes. That's the big idea. Now, providence is a word we don't use much anymore. If you read stuff back from the 1800s, providence is mentioned a lot. Uh, but it's not something we, we mention a lot now. We use other words, other terms and phrases to talk about the plan that God has for our world and for us. Providence is a uh, it, what that means is that it's an act that God will act purposely for providing for and sustaining our world. As we say today, God is in control. Yeah. Uh, providence doesn't mean that uh, uh, we're not active, joining with God in doing good things. God invites us to join with him in his work and to bring about his good plan. Do you notice I didn't say our good plans? There have been so many times in my life where I had a plan and it didn't work out. Uh, but God's plan was still in place. Providence also doesn't mean that God makes bad things happen to you. Um, a lot of times skeptics will say, well, if there's a loving God, why, does, why do these bad things happen? And there's a lot of answers to that. I think none of them are 100% satisfactory, but we, uh, we do know that God is in charge, God has a plan, and then even when evil people are doing things to you, he can use that. We're going to start today with... Uh, uh, Esther and uh, I think as I speak every three months or so I'm going to uh, focus on the women in the Bible I know that uh, some of the women have been through Bible studies and that's kind of old topic for them but most of us guys haven't and there are a lot of women in the Bible who accomplish things that only a woman would accomplish Today, we'll hear things about, you know, on TV about, well, this is the first woman to scale Mount Everest. This is the first woman to, you know, win the drag racing championship. That's not the kind of thing I'm talking about. I'm talking about the things that only a woman could do. And Esther is one of those uh, women that a man simply couldn't do what she did. Um, before we get a little, go a little further, I want to have, give you some background uh, about Esther. I hope this isn't too much like a college class or something, but, uh, but it helps understand the story. And uh, I found that I've read through this story and really not picked up every, a lot of things because I didn't de delve into the background very much. Esther is uh, one of two books in which um, God is not mentioned. The other is the Song of Solomon. And those books were uh, controversial about whether or not they should be in the Bible because the word God or Lord was not in them. But God is in them. You see God working through these, uh, these events. And in this case, Esther saves a nation, saves a whole group of people that would have been destroyed, but we're, um, also Esther is a book that is somewhat like a play. Each chapter is like its own act or scene. And there are, and it, uh, it's important to uh, kind of, okay, once I've got through chapter one, I can say, okay, got that. Now what's gonna happen in act two? Uh, so we're, and we're gonna do one and two today Next time, we'll do the rest. 
uh, that I, I thought. Esther is also full of plot twists. You know, you think you're going one direction, you're reading along, and you go, I know where this is going to go. And then as a good friend of mine says, boom, chakalaka, it changes. Uh, and he's like, oh, I didn't see that coming. And it's full of these plot twists, these unexpected things, these coincidences that we know are not coincidences. Uh, Esther also was written or this, these events happened in about 450 BC. So that would be uh, what, 2,600 years ago or more? 2,700 years ago? And uh, uh, the Jewish festival of Purim is still celebrated today, and it's to commemorate the events in Esther. That's how important those events are is that they still celebrate that today. Let's read the first, uh, first few verses. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. And some of you may have a translation that uses a different name. There are three names often used for this same king. I picked this one because of my vast scriptural knowledge. No, no. <laughs> actually I picked this one because it was the easiest one for me to pronounce. So <laughs> Xerxes. Uh, Xerxes, who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. That's a lot of land. I didn't bring a map. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. Now, a citadel is like a fort that sits in the middle of a city most of the time, and it's got walls, and it's armed, and it's kind of the, kind of like having the Capitol building and the White House all behind these walls and well defended. So it's an important place. People in the city look at the Citadel and go, that's where the action is. Uh, and, it, and that's where they will go if they're ever attacked, inside that, that well-armed place. The military leaders of Persia and Medea, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. For a full 180 days, he displayed his vast, the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet, lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace. For all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the city uh, in the citadel of Susa the garden had hangings of white and blue linen fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rugs on marble pillars let me read that again because I didn't put the emphasis where it needs to be the, the these these uh, the, these pieces of cloth, they, held, they had silver rings hanging from them, and uh, they were hung on marble pillars. This is quite a place. Uh, there were couches of gold and silver. Have you ever sat on a couch made of gold? I haven't. I don't think I've ever even seen that much gold. A mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold. Each one was different from the other, and the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberty, liberty, that means generosity. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions. What do you think happened when you have a banquet and everybody can drink all they want for seven days? Yeah, some of us have been there. Uh, <laughs> it's not good. Uh, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. Xerxes ruled over the Medeo uh, Persian Empire. It was huge. Uh, they had uh, the king before him, or a king before him, Cyrus, 
had, inv had invaded Babylon and won, won a war and uh, freed the Jewish people. And so they had all this land in the Middle East. It included what now is today is Egypt, Iran, parts of India, uh, and Asia Minor, and the eastern border of Greece. You can kind of get a picture uh, of how big this was. And Xerxes was very proud of everything that he had. Um, the empire had ruled over those Jews for 200 years. Uh, God had told the Jews, though, that they needed to go back to Jerusalem, that he would bless them. But Xerxes, like his father before him, Darius, and his grandfather before that, Cyrus, they were friendly to the Jews. They weren't quite equal, but they were friendly. They weren't being persecuted like they were in Babylon. So they got very comfortable. And a lot of people, when God asked them to go ahead and go back to Ju uh, Judah and to reestablish a Jewish nation with Jewish worship, decided not to go. So all the Jews that you are reading about here or hearing about here are in a state of rebellion because they're comfortable. I don't want to change. I don't want to take that walk. It's 850 miles from where they were to Jerusalem. That would take maybe two, three months to walk. And uh, uh, so all these Jews didn't return to Jerusalem. They didn't establish the nation. They just decided, you know, we've got it good here. We're going to stay here. King, uh, King Cyrus, who was Xerxes' grandfather, uh, allowed the Jews to return without any problem. He even supported them. He helped them rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He uh, paid for those rebuilding effort, efforts himself. And then his son, King Darius, Xerxes' father, he's the guy, if you remember, who was tricked into putting Daniel into the lion's den. And then once Daniel didn't die in the lion's den, he became extremely friendly to the Jews. Um, they all, you know, you've got three generations of kings who have been friendly to the Jews. That is something that we probably don't quite get in terms of we haven't, as Americans, been moved out of oppression in our lifetime, out of slavery, into uh, a kingdom that is friendly to us. King Vashti, Queen Vashti was also had also been a person who was very special. And by that, I don't mean she rode the, the smart, short bus to school. She's special. And uh, she had been a king's daughter. Uh, but she was uh, captured, kidnapped, by uh, Xerxes' grandfather and brought in and became Xerxes' wife. Now, that's a strategy I never thought of when I was looking for a wife, to have my granddad kidnap somebody. You know, that, that one got past me. I learned something, you know. But uh, she was, uh, she, you know, she was beautiful. So, you know, he didn't kill her like he killed many others. And uh, let's go ahead and read, in, uh, starting with verse 10. Uh, On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was high in spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, me, me human, Bizza, Harbona, Bigtha, Ab Abacatha, uh, Zather, and Carxus, I think I probably butchered all those names, to bring before him Queen Vashti wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and others and nobles. For she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. You know, Xerxes here demands something of his wife, the queen, that no woman would want to do, that I know of. Uh, he's treating her like an object that he wants to show off. He wants to show her off and have other men be envious of, uh, of him because she's so beautiful. And she just says no. 
uh, he, you know, I want to be treated like a person. So he, 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 instead of being treated like an object, she wants to be treated like, like a person, to be loved and appreciated. But Xerxes, after seven days of wine, is acting a little bit like a drunk middle schooler. And uh, that doesn't go over well with her. Now, what happens when you disobey the king? You know, bad things. So uh, Xerxes, he doesn't know what to do. Um, he's prideful, he's drunk, he's arrogant, all of which is sinful behavior and that shows the true nature of his heart. It's all about me, is what Xerxes' mindset was. And he's had this, remember, 180 days of showing off, a 10-day banquet, or some, you know, a banquet. And now, at kind of the pinnacle of this, all this, he wants his queen to come in. And she says, no, nah, I don't think so. Um, he felt like everybody around him was to be used for his desires and for his purposes. Have you met anybody like that in the past? who just, like, it's all about me. Jason, thank you. Uh, that's an attitude that's hard to get over, especially when you're in the position of power. Um, starting again at verse 12. Since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times and were clo closest to the king. Karshana, Selthar, Admantha, Tarshish, Mar uh, Marius, Marcina, and Menu Khan, the seven nobles of Persia and Medea, who had special access to the king, his inner circle, and were the highest in the kingdom. Uh, according to the law, what must be done to Queen Vashti, the king asked them. Now, think about this. You're in the king's inner circle. And even though I butchered those names, uh, again, uh, you know they don't want things to change because they're powerful and they get their power from the king. And so he's going to them saying, what should I do with her? And they tell him, she not only has, she has not, she has not obeyed the command of the king, Xerxes, that eunuchs have taken to her. Then Mimkin replied, in the presence of the king, and the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but against all the nobles and the peoples of the, all the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will become known to all women, and so they will despise their husbands and say King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she would not come. This very day, the Persian and Medea Median women of nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of the disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Medea, which cannot be repealed that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also, let the king give her royal, her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Then when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast reign, all the women will respect their husbands from the, to uh, uh, from the least to the greatest. The king and his nobles were pleased with this advice. So the king did as Mim Mimucan proposed. He sent dispatches to all the kingdom, to each providence in his own script, and to each people in their own language, proclaiming that every man should be the ruler of their own household, using the, his native tongue. So, basically, you got Xerxes, you know, his inner circle, and they're saying, King, if you let this pass, all these women are going to get uppity. And we don't want that to happen because they're going to get in our faces and they're not going to respect us and they're not going to obey us. So you've got to do something to keep that from happening. 
I mean, wouldn't it throw the whole kingdom in chaos if the women had opinions of their own? Right? Isn't that the logic? And we wouldn't want things to change because we're next to the power. So you got to get rid of her. Fortunately, I, you know, he didn't kill her. He just sent her away. Uh, you know, and they say, you need to get somebody better. And by better, what they mean is somebody who's more submissive. Uh, Vashti paid a steep price for standing up to authority. Have you ever had to stand up to authority and you paid a price for it? You know, I have. I had a job once where they asked me to negotiate a contract with some people that we would use as a dealer in Europe because we were tired of taking European phone calls at night. So we negotiated this deal and everything that was sold in Europe, we paid them a percentage. One week later, one of the Europeans called and asked how, many, how much stuff can we get on a container, shipping container, and the president of the company figured it out for him and wasn't gonna pay our, our dealer, our distributor. I was like, you can't do that. We just signed the contract less than a week ago. Here, we have to pay them this percentage. Well, they didn't do anything, darn it. They'll never know. I knew in that conversation that I wasn't long to stay there because uh, he was going to do whatever he wanted to do no matter what he promised. And it was uh, maybe a month later he came in and said, you know what, I've sold the company. Uh, part of the deal is I get your job and you don't have a job. So I was looking for a job again. But fortunately found one uh, real quickly. But uh, you stand up to power, if you, you're gonna pay a price. And as Christians, we have to stand up sometimes. You know, we have to say this is right, this is wrong. Yesterday I was driving through Newton and uh, the Catholic parish was having a uh, I guess you would call it a demonstration on the, on the vote Tuesday. And there was counter protesters coming. And uh, they were angry. You know, I don't know why it ended up happening in that situation. But, uh, you know, they were going to pay a price for standing up for what they believed in and for what they, wanted, they thought Christ wanted them to do, the people with, at the parish. So that's a simple example. Losing a job is a simple example. Sometimes you lose your freedom and you lose your life. And I t tend to wonder if we're not heading towards that day here and now because the persecution and the, uh, against Christians is getting worse right here, even though we're very fortunate. Okay. Uh, but this whole thing set off a chain of events that will give a nation and keep the Jews from being destroyed. Have you ever had something that, you ch that changed your life forever? Anybody? I have. What do you do when you see in so much, you're in so much pain that you don't think your life will ever be worthwhile again? Keep your eyes on Jesus. You remember that God is always at work around you to accomplish his purposes. Keep your eyes on Jesus when bad things happen. This is true even when we just can't see anything good coming out of the situation. Remember, Jesus promised that he would send us a comforter, the Holy Spirit. The comforter in Romans 8, 26 and 27, uh, Paul says, also the Spirit helps us with our weaknesses. Our weakness. We do not know how to pray as, he, as we should, but the Spirit himself speaks to God for us, even begs God for us with deep feelings that words cannot explain. God can see what's in people's hearts, and he knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit speaks to God 
for his people in the way God wants. Now think about that. The Holy Spirit is praying with you, through you, for you. We talk a lot about having a prayer partner. Can't think of a better one than the Holy Spirit. You know, when we just don't have the words, the Holy Spirit will pray for us, will pray with us. But we have to submit ourselves, and we have to keep our eyes on the Lord for that to happen. When your challenges are such, and they're so huge, um, and there's so much in your face that you just can't see how any of these problems could ever be used for good, remember this. The Holy Spirit will actually pray for you when you can't find the words. Have you ever had a time when you couldn't find the words? You didn't know how to pray? I mean, doesn't happen a lot to me, but it has happened. Certainly has. Thank you. And uh, you just have to remain open to God using you during those times as he sees fit. Continue to act righteously even though bad things are happening to you and bad people are doing things to you. Don't be frustrated and, and uh, when you pray because you know the situation is God's working in it for his purposes. The Holy Spirit will help you and will pray what is in your mind even when you can't find the words. Let's take a look at Esther chapter 2. Now, Esther chapter 2, you know, we talked about the different scenes, the different acts. Uh, Esther chapter 2 should be called the, the, the search for a new queen is on. You know? Uh, the amount of time that passes between chapter 1 and chapter 2 is about four years. Uh, in that four-year period, King Xerxes uh, attacked Greece. And that didn't work out for him very well. He was able to keep his kingdom, but Greece was not defeated. Um, so, uh, you know, Xerxes, again, is feeling powerful and steps out there, takes on more than he can handle. And, uh, he, and, and you know, He's harmed by this. So he's, you know, he's really in the mindset that I want to get a beautiful queen. Um, let's read verses 1, uh, for, read in chapter 2. Later, when King Xerxes was not so angry, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and his order about her. And remember, that order cannot be reversed at that time. Then the king's personal servant suggested... Let a search be made for beautiful young girls for the king. Let the king choose supervisors in every state of his kingdom to bring every beautiful girl to the palace at Susa. They should be taken to the women's quarters and put under the care of Haggai, the king's eunuch in charge of the women. And let beauty uh, treatments be given to them then let the girls who most please the king become queen, or the girl who most pleases the king become queen in place of Vashti. The king liked this idea. I imagine he did. You know, we're going to search the kingdom for pretty women and bring them to him? Yeah, I bet he liked that idea. Uh, now, there was a Jewish man in the place of Susa whose name was Mordecai, son of Jair. Jair was the son of Shemel the son of Kish. Mordecai was from the tribe of Benjamin. Mordecai was a Jew, which had been taken captive from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who you remember was defeated earlier. Uh, they were part of a group taken into captivity with Jerohochin, Jerohochin, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, who had no father or mother. So Mordecai took care of her. Hadassah was also called Esther, and she had a very pretty figure and face. Mordecai had adopted her as his own daughter 
when her father and mother died. I was with a group of friends yesterday, um, all guys, uh, all believers. And they said, Mark, what are you going to preach on tomorrow? I said, I'm going to preach on my favorite topic, smoking hot women. <laughs> and they looked at me like, what? And I said, well, that's what the Bible says. I'm going to speak on Esther. It says she was pretty. You know, we don't have pictures, but I assume the Bible's true. And she, you know, she's brought in with all these other women and, uh, and you know, given beauty treatments, um, I don't know how many. I've, I've seen estimates of that they started out with maybe 500 women, gave them all beauty treatments, and then started narrowing them down. Again, you know, uh, it was quite a process that they went through. A pro this, this process to find the replacement the process was not like a Miss Universe pageant. The process itself took a long time. And the women who were not selected usually ended up in the king's harem and were never married. So there was a lot of stake at stake here for these ladies. Our culture, uh, you, you know, when you're in that culture, it clouds your, your, your view of things. And uh, it clouds your view of God and how he's working. And as I was reading this, I was thinking about, what if this was a reality TV show? This would kind of be the, the ultimate reality. You have all these pretty women competing against each other for the king's attention. Can you imagine the comments that were, would be made behind the scenes? You know, about Esther and everybody else. Um, that, because there was a lot at stake. Your life was going to be either as a part of a harem or you were going to be queen. Well, Xerxes certainly was living in a way where he was pursuing his own desires. And people were getting hurt through this process. Do you live in a way where you pursue your own desires or do you pers and pursue the things that your culture says that we make us a success? Or do you live in a way where God is at your center and you want to help God reach his goals, participate with God in his goals? It's hard to know sometimes. You know, because we're told that certain things are really good and they're not necessarily sinful. So it really stands as to where is your heart in these things? Are you pursuing these things day after day because you're going to make a little more money, you're going to get more prestige, uh, you're going to get th something that makes other people envious, or are you pursuing those things so that you can be uh, in a relationship with Christ and bring more people to him? That's something that we can't see. I can't see, I can't look at you and say, oh, you know, they're, they're, they're not pursuing God, they're pursuing these, these other things. Uh, you have to examine that for yourself. Now, I might have some clue based on things you say, but ultimately, that's for you to determine. Do you find yourself ever where people around you think you're weird? All the time, yeah, okay. Well, maybe I am. Yeah, I don't know. But I found myself in a conversation with a coworker this week, and we were talking about retirement. He's, we're about the same age, and he said, well, when are you going to retire? I said, I don't know. And he says, well, you know, I want to do this, and I want to do that, and I want to make sure I have enough money to do that. And, you know, just all these plans, which... Is typical. I mean, that's what most people judge when they have enough. And I said, well, uh, you may not understand this. <laughs> it may seem strange to you, but I would just want to have Jesus at the center of my life. And uh, I, pr I don't know if I have a, I, I don't know if I have enough for him to do the things he wants me to do or not. 
but he's going to tell me, and I'll know when it's time. And uh, he kind of looked at me and shook his head, but I could see in the eyes he was thinking, weird, <laughs> strange, you know? If I'd said, well, I don't have enough money to buy a Corvette yet, that would have been perfectly understandable. You know, but to say, I'm going to choose to make that big change in life when I think I can do the most for Christ was totally outside what our world thinks. And you have to live with that. Um, now, I don't particularly think this guy is going to go around talking about, you know, that brown, he's a weird Jesus freak. But others would. Others would. You could very much pay a price for that in terms of popularity or esteem. But I'm confident that God is in control. Despite the bad things that happen. Are you confident in that? I... Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I'm not a particularly brave person. You can probably tell by looking at me that I'm not a Navy SEAL. Um, but I had an accident recently where ended up the riding lawnmower tipped over on top of me, and I was pinned under the mower underwater. And uh, I was thinking... I really have to get my nose above water. But I was trapped. Uh, one of the control arms on this mower had bent and pinned my legs against the mower. And the water was about here, at this level. And I wiggled, and I, but I didn't feel scared. Maybe it was just because it happened so fast. I don't know. But it was like, is this the way I'm going to go? If it is, it's okay. But I'm going to fight against it. And... Uh, uh, I, was a I was surprised. Now, the people that witnessed it, they weren't so calm. <laughs> Which, you know, I appreciate them so much. Uh, I was able to get out, got my nose and mouth above water, and then thought, okay, I'm good. God's still got a use for me. Now, how am I going to get out of the rest of this? You know? And it's just one of those moments where you, uh, you realize that because you have God in your life, you're a little different. And people would say, Are you, were you scared? Not really. Now, afterwards, I started shaking, you know, uh, but it was, there was a calmness, even though I was underwater couldn't, and couldn't get out for a little bit. I, you'll surprise yourself sometimes when you keep your eyes on God, how that affects things, unexpected things that come up. Another indication that maybe your eyes are on God and you're living differently than the world is your social media posts. Are they as angry as everybody else's? Um, I have a cousin uh, who gets on Facebook and she writes these profane things about you people. And I know that she's talking to two people, maybe at the most. But she has 400 followers and we all get it. You know, and it's like, She's so angry that um, she can't think that through, you know? And are your social media posts like that? If not, put your eyes on, if they are, put your eyes on Jesus. Let's go back to the Bible. Chapter 2, verse 8. Start there. When the king's command and order had been heard, many girls had been brought to the palace in Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther was also taken into the king's palace and put under the care of Haggai, who was in charge of the women. Esther pleased Haggai, and he liked her. So Haggai quickly began giving Esther her beauty treatments and special food. He gave her, I guess Haggai was that, that, that time's version of a personal trainer, you know, give her special food and beauty treatments. And maybe he wasn't selling her the products, I don't know. But uh, he, he gave her seven servant girls chosen from the king's palace. Then he moved her and her seven servant girls to the best part of the women's quarters. Esther did not tell anyone about her family 
or who her people were because Mordecai had told her not to. The reason Mordecai told her not to is he knew that the king, if he knew she was Jewish, he would not select her. I mean, they were, they were treated well, but they're still second-class citizens. Every day, Mordecai walked back and forth near the courtyard where the king's women lived to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. I think this guy loved her like a child. Before a girl could take her turn with King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments. A whole year. Again, think of this as a reality TV show. Ooh, that thing just goes on forever. Uh, for six months, she was treated with oil and myrrh. And for six months, with perfumes and cosmetics. Then she was ready to go to the king. Anything she asked for was given to her to take with her for the woman's quarter, uh, from the woman's quarters to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go to the king's palace, and in the morning, she would return to another part of the women's quarters. Then she would be placed under the care, I don't know how to say that word, but I'm going to say it, Shagazgez, the king's eunuch in charge of the slave women. The girl would not go back to the king again unless he was pleased with her and asked for her by name. The time came for Esther, daughter of Abihail, Mordecai's, uh, Mordecai's uncle, who had been adopted by Mordecai to go to the king. She asked only what Haggai suggested she should take. Haggai was the king's eunuch who was in charge of the women. Everyone who saw Esther liked her. Now, the fact that everybody who saw Esther liked her in this competitive struggle tells me that she must have been humble. You know, she wasn't going around saying, you know, I'm better than you. Uh, you've got this kind of mark on your face and it's not pretty. Um, she wasn't backbiting. And, you know, God sometimes... Uh, will supplement and use our personal humility by bringing us public favor, you know, to point people towards him. You have not, we, we talk a lot about persecution and not being popular, but also if you follow God, you're more likable. You know, you're not offending people all the time. And God sometimes will bring you favor. And it's very important that you realize that popularity or that favor, who's behind it? It's not you. God is using you. In the 70s, back before I was born, uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, there was a singer named Don Francisco, and he had a song about Balaam's mule, donkey. Remember Balaam's donkey uh, could see the angel that was, and Balaam was going someplace where God didn't want him to go, and the, and the donkey talked to Balaam. And uh, the final line in that song is, if the Lord is using you, don't pay it any, more, any mind because he could use the dog next door if he was so inclined. You know, that speaks to the power of our God and that God can use us and the attitude that we ought to have. We're blessed to be used by God. We're not we're not thinking we're being used by God because we're so special. All right, verse 16. So Esther was taken to King Xerxes in the royal palace in the 10th month, the month of Tebeth, during Xerxes' seventh year as king. Remember, we started out with Xerxes in, as a fairly new king. We're now in his seventh year as king. Again, this is a long process. And the king was pleased with Esther more than any other of the other girls. He liked her more than any of the other girls, so he put a royal crown on her head and made her queen in the palace of Vashti. Then the king gave a great banquet for Esther, invited all his important men and royal officers. He announced a holiday for the whole empire and had, a government give away, had the government give away gifts. Now Mordecai was sitting in the king's gate when the girls 
were gathered the second time. Esther still had not told anyone about her, her family or who her people were. Just as Mordecai had commanded her, she obeyed Mordecai just as she had done when she was under his care. It's interesting, speaking to the humility again. Humility gives you wisdom. Um, at this point, uh, Esther outranked Mordecai. Um, you know, she was, she was like the kid who, who had had a lot of success from a work, you know, who comes from a working class family, has a lot of success and says, I don't need those people anymore. You know, uh, I'm better, I'm more sophisticated, I'm, you know, all this. Uh, you know, I've seen a lot of families that have experienced that, that their kids, once they get so much education, kind of quit talking to them, kind of go do their own thing. Uh, don't respect them anymore. Um, but Esther, in her humility, had wisdom about uh, what orders to take and, and, and how she pronounced whether or not she was Jewish or not. And she followed Mordecai's instruction because she could see the wisdom in it. It probably was tempting to for, for her in this high-ranking environment to come out and say, ha ha, you just named a Jew queen. Uh, you know, that might be my kind of tendency if, if I was in a second, a second class citizen and then achieved a high position, you know, to let the cat out of the bag a, a little early. She had just become queen after this long process. And uh, she didn't abandon her family even though she'd become queen. Today, we re read about people that marry into royal families and, uh, you know, they no longer get along with their, you know, look at the magazines when you're at the store next time and see how many of them are about somebody that married into a royal family and now they're cut off from the family. Um, humility in our, in our society is in very short supply. In the days of internet uh, influencers, Photoshop, public relations experts and being and being famous just for being famous you don't see a lot of humility I would ask you do you walk in humility I don't mean low self esteem but I mean knowing uh, yourself and being humble humility breeds character there's a saying about character and that is that it's revealed by the things you do when nobody's watching. Esther's humility led to one of those coincidences that we'll talk about in the future that saved a nation. Here's chapter, or verse 21. Now Bixa and Teresh were two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway. While Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, they became angry and began to make plans to kill King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about their plans and told Queen Esther. Esther told the king and how Mordecai had discovered the evil plan. When the report was investigated, it was found to be true. And the two officers who had planned to kill the king were hanged. All this was written down in the daily court record of the king's palace. Just a coincidence, right? That Mordecai happened to overhear this? You know, that somebody's going to try to kill the king? I don't think so. We'll hear more in the next sermon that I do about how that worked out and how more coincidences and more twists and turns in the plot happened. Uh, I'd urge you to read the whole book of Esther and just look for coincidences and term and and, and, and twists and turns in the plot. And remember that very important word when you see a twist in the plot, boom shakalaka. You know, it's like ooh, boom shakalaka. There it is. Uh, you know, but for today, I just want to leave you with some questions for reflection. What gifts and ability has God given you? to join in his work. Everybody has a gift. Even Buddy. 
<laughs> I always pick on Buddy, I'm sorry. <laughs> but he has many gifts, believe me. Uh, and we all have a gift. Use it. Use it for God's purposes. Join him. Is your Christian walk characterized by humility? Or do you somehow believe because you're saved that you uh, are better than others? Um, you know, one of the frustrating things for a pastor in a church like Crossroads is uh, people come here in really bad shape. They get in recovery. Uh, they stay sober for a while. They have kids. And then they go to a different church. And I've heard people actually say, well, yeah, I changed churches because I don't want my kids to be around people like that. You are one of those people. Come on. What a testament to God's power. To God, that God changes things. You want to move to a fancy church because you don't want your kids to be around people who uh, are in recovery? Makes no sense to me. But some of you may be able to explain it to me. Uh, how is God calling you to step up when no one else is watching? Step up when no one else is watching. Have you been looking around for little things you can do when no one else is watching? You know, doing what I'm doing right now is pretty easy because everybody's watching. You know, they might not like what I say or I might not do a great job, but everybody's watching. So you get credit for that in a sense. What do you do that you don't get credit for? What do you do in secret? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us see how we can join you in your work. Help us remain humble in our work for you and be able to see the needs that others have and how we can use our gifts and skills to meet that need. Lord, help us promote your kingdom on earth. Keep us away from temptation. Help us see your will in all that we do. And when we can't see how the things that are happening to us ever will result in anything good, Help us keep our eyes on you. Pray these things in Jesus' name.